Okay, hello everyone. Um, nice to see you here. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm um, looking forward to some of the questions about your machines. They were great. Um, so this panel um, explores making design education. Um, and I'm Ben Stouffer, and I'm one of the proposers of this event, um, and I'm one of the people that, uh, one of the organizers of yesterday's Mini Maker Fair. Um, and I'm the program director for Interactive and Visual Communication, uh, LCC. Um, and uh, one of my motivations to, to uh, bring this event together and also the Maker Fair to LCC is the, the kind of um, maker culture that was demonstrated yesterday is. Is, is a kind of motive force in tertiary art and design education. And the idea of uh, kind of making things and putting something together, I think one of, that's, if you're into that at school, that's one of the reasons you end up at art school, is you like making stuff. Um, and and, and I, th I wanted to explore that relationship uh, a, a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience of uh, what I would call making it, um, in my teaching over the last 10 years. And then I'm going to ask the, pan uh, the, the panelists, apart from Tim, who's obviously just spoken, uh, to talk briefly. And some of them have got slides and some of them have got things to show you. Okay. So um, I'm going to... I'm going to do myself first. So Ben Stofer, I'm here from LCC. I'm a PhD researcher in, in Information Experience Design at the Royal College of Art. Um, I've worked as a designer for 10 years and a design tutor. And as an academic, I'm interested in how digital culture is changing design practice, particularly the development of new forms of communication design and the emergence of collaborative design practice and new processes of making. So how people are coalesc coalescing around um, particular technologies or processes, forming communities around those processes, and how the design community is tapping into those things. And that's some of the stuff I want to explore on this panel. Um, we also, on this panel, we have um, Biggles Riddell. Um, Biggles is an interactive designer, website consultant, senior lecturer on the BA Design for Interaction and Moving Image at London College of Communication, which he helped create. And his work frequently spans uh, normally separate disciplines, leading to a wide variety of roles for the creative director to a 3D product designer, typographer to automata maker. And over 28 years of experience, uh, design experience has seen the convergence of all this uh, work into, into interactive design. One part of his focus has been on produ producing odd objects um, that surface the light-hearted but often uh, contain a more serious message. And he'll be showing you some of those, I'm sure. Um, Kev we have Kevin Walker. Uh, Kevin Walker is a researcher, designer, design writer, and artist working at the boundaries of the digital and physical, specifically in curation and computation in physical spaces, grounded in cognitive and cultural theory. Authors of Hackers and Slackers, um, uh, 2012, and co-editor of Dig Digital Technologies and the Museum Experience 2008, and his background is in journalism, design, interactive media, education, and research. Okay. Uh, we also have Rachel Rayans, and Rachel is a 24-year-old artist and maker based in Norwich. She has run creative business since she was, since she was 14, founded a non-for-profit non gallery community space and celluloid film lab in central Norwich upon graduating uh, in 2011. She's, Rachel is, um, there's just been a um, Rachel approached Raspberry Pi with the uh, proposal of starting an artist in residency scheme, um, and she's the first, she was appointed the first artist in residence. Um, her new project, Zoe Star, includes a horde of neurotic and humorous robotic machines which are designed to initiate debate about how we, as users and makers, engage with technology. Um, and my last panel member is Brock Craft. Um, Brock's work has centered on human interaction design and usability in a variety of domains, including human computer interaction, product design, uh, digital art and learning. He's a lecturer at Goldsmiths, University of London in the Department of Computing and he's a senior tutor on the MA Information Experience Design at the Royal College of Art. Brock was also a partner at the Internet of Things design firm Tinker London. He's a specialist in human computer interaction, informi information visualization, physical computing and learning design. Uh, Brock is also the author of the recently re uh, released book uh, Arduino Pro Projects for Dummies. So there's your plug. <laughs> okay. So, um, can we have the slides up? Okay. Okay, so, making. So in the, in the last um, 10 years that I've worked as a tutor, um, as, I, as I've said, processes of making and, and, and physical things have become more embedded in, in, in the kind of design curriculum at a tertiary level. Um, and what I wanted to show you is uh, an example from a few years ago. It's actually a project that our man um, on the, uh, the booth up there will recognize. 
um, because it, it's, 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 an, um, it's, a, it's a short um, example of how making enters the curriculum and the kind of uh, situation that leads to this kind of thing happening. So, wh what happens is someone demos something and it goes out on YouTube. So that's number one up there and that's uh, Jeff Han from NYC demoing multi-touch. This is before the iPhone. So this is demonstrating multi-touch the first time, uh, something that's com become completely ubiquitous in five years, but the time was, was radically new. Um, number two, um, so students uh, Google that and think, I want, I, want to, I want to make something. I want to make a project. I want to find out how that works. There's no manual for that. So how, how, do, you, how do you get involved in that? So you hit, hit up Google. And then what, what you find is in um, number three there, someone at IDO has made a, um, a kind of prototyping an API around that, which makes it easy for kind of design students to interact with. Um, and they've released that open source. Um, and then, the, so their IDO multi-touch um, API, which uh, is, uses um, a, hacked, um, a hacked webcam to scan a piece of glass in infrared. So it's kind of uses off the shelf, elect I think it was a PlayStation webcam that we used to make this. Um, so that gets released um, from, from um, IDO's labs, and then uh, my students pick this up, okay, and, uh, and start making stuff with it. And that, that, that's a real illustration of how, how quickly that happens. That happens in a matter, matter of weeks. And it, so in design education at uh, a university level, um, I think that, that that kind of making spirit that you saw on display at the Maker Faire yesterday is, is kind of clearly present in, the, in, in a kind of designer's training. So, you, you know, uh, you start, how all makers start, you start making stuff, right, how's it put together, you hit the workshop, you put something really kind of low together, you, you get your soldering kit out. Um, you start prototyping, and you're in, when, you, when you're doing that, you're, you're prototyping in hardware and software, um, and you're using kind of you're putting things together that might not have been thought of as compatible, and you're, so you're kind of hacking all your way, all the way through that process. You're, you're kind of bringing yourself together, and, and you're you're trying to be self-sufficient in a way that I think is very um, uh, uh, something commensurate with what uh, the maker community. Yeah, is, is, is really celebrating. It's your, your, your kind of empowerment to get to grips, break things, understand them, and, and, and build new things. Um, so that's just an example of uh, Tom and there his fingers are represented on that iMac. Um, and then, we, you know, you do, you, design, you do some user testing, you do this um, iterative process, and that's something that Biggles, I'm sure, will talk a bit about. Um, and so that's, um, that's showing you how the glow of the infrared is being picked up on the plate of glass um, in there. So that's, that's just what that image is. And then in design, you end, up with, you end up doing something with it. And I think that might be, um, that might be a, a, a key difference and something we might talk about as a panel is, is design always, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of end product sometimes in mind, but I don't think it's in mind often at the start of the process. And I think that's where uh, making design has a lot to, to kind of uh, learn from making culture. So you start tinkering and you end up, and, and so that project ended up as a kind of prototype for a touchscreen display for a DNA debrief which is a, ha a Hamley's uh, shop window. Um, so, so that, that kind of, that, that, that kind of uh, bit where you get into application um, might be uh, kind of more from the design end, but I, I think it owes, that solution owes a lot to the culture of making and, and kind of communities are helping each other and kind of understanding how some of that black box stuff works. Okay, so the, hopefully this panel will explore making culture in design education um, and iterative process and exploration. That's some of the things uh, that I'm, I'm really uh, keen to explore in the questions. Um, and I think one of the reasons I put this panel together is I think that these two, things, these two communities have an affinity of process. So as uh, tools and platforms converge, uh, makers and designers offer, you know, you could walk into studios at LCC uh, or walk into the London hack space and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You know, I'm sure it's the same at Goldsmiths or, and it's definitely the same at the RCA. Uh, and I think that making, um, and making and design, in fact, all forms of, of production are much more social now than they were 10 years ago. So people can connect over the internet, form uh, special interest groups, form around bits of production. So it's a social process. And I think that that's one of the most important um, aspects that brings these two communities together. And, and it's one of the reasons why I was particularly motivated to, to host a Maker Faire at LCC and, and have a forum to, to discuss what, what that means for both communities. 
Um, and I think that design particularly, d design is an applied art. I mean, you only have to walk around this building to see the, the result of the last um, thousand, well, 2,000 years of kind of applied creativity. Um, and, I, and I think making is the same thing. It, it's, it's people um, built, you know, uh, getting creative with stuff. You know, I think the nature of our stuff is evolving. Um, we have embedded computing, um, and our ability to talk about the stuff we make is, is only expanded. But again, I think that the that, that idea of applied creativity is something that um, brings the two communities together. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm gonna just ask uh, Kevin to come up and say a few words, and then I'm gonna ask Kevin to hand over to Biggles. Okay, thanks. Um, I won't say too much, so we can get on with the sort of questions, the panel bit of the panel. Um, ooh, it's moving by itself. Something's happening. There are different things on different screens. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin. Um, this is the program that I run. Uh, it's a postgraduate program. It sort of says it all there, if you can read that. Um, we have MAs, we have uh, PhDs like Ben, um, and it's a lot of fun. Um, I will say really only a couple of things. Um, we do making as a form of research. It's everything you've heard before. It's everything that Tim does and everything that Ben just said with research. So we do making as a form of research. We do research to inform our making. And we do uh, breaking as a form of making. So hacking, taking things apart. One of the things that we do is something called, that we call decomputation. So um, it takes the steps of what's called computational thinking, this very orderly sort of process of taking a problem or a thing and breaking it down into pieces and then looking for patterns in the data and then abstracting that and making something new. So we do that usually without using computers at all. Um, things like um, social systems, the family, the VNA, the government, um, language, uh, finance, things like that. So you can see some of the projects on the website. Um, the other thing that we do is a sort of political aspect, um, really um, from Cory Doctorow, you know, embracing the sort of political um, stuff behind the technology. There's always a human and some agenda behind every technology. Um, so we run this thing called uh, Space Program, uh, which is really about programming spaces, physical spaces. Can we use technology, use things to influence people's behavior and to call their attention to particular things? Here's a project that was shown here at the VNA a few weeks ago. Uh, it's honey, uh, other way around. It's data as honey, people as sort of worker bees, you know, in the great hive of the city and so forth. So, um, really, it comes from people like Tim. Um, Tim, you didn't mention uh, Secret Life of Machines, which was my inspiration growing up. So go to Tim's website, watch every episode of that, and then you have, you'll be well grounded for life, I think, pretty much. Uh, and listen to Corey's talks as well that you can get online, and you'll be well set up to come over and, and play with us. Um, so, so that's me. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Uh, you did hear correctly. My, everyone does m call me Biggles. Um, in fact, that's inherited from when uh, I first walked into art school and I took my uh, helmet off. I rode a motorbike then as now, and somebody said, oh, morning, Biggles, and it's stuck. And I've got married as Biggles. You can give me a check, and I can cash it as Biggles, essentially. I'm stuck with it. Um, if I sound nervous, uh, that's only because I am, because I'm... <laughs> been sitting next door to one of my heroes. Um, uh, just an extraordinary chap, so, so forgive me if I get over the flusters a little bit. Um, I started, when I left the RCA, I went uh, into advertising and uh, soon got to know that I didn't really like advertising, I loved design. Uh, I've been freelance all my life uh, and I was a freelance uh, creative director and I liked making things and at the time, uh, nobody was really making 3D illustration, and I, I'm not really an illustrator as such, but I, I, I realized that you can actually express things through 3D. Um, uh, and I'm mainly a graphic designer, and I moved through from that, I was in the right place at the right time when the internet happened, and that started me thinking not so much about uh, the sort of geeky side of website design, but the fact that most websites didn't work in the same way 
uh, that most uh, video recorders didn't really, people didn't really seem to know how to use them. And if you got a phone, you had a, a huge manual to go with it. Um, and in the, so I started uh, doing more and more website design that was more and more simple, and that's basically how I earned my living. But at the same time, I was also asked to do some teaching, and I love, found out that I love teaching, and I've been teaching uh, two days a week ever since. When Ben invited me along, I said, can you, you know, bring some, some slides of your work? I'm not showing you any advertising, I'm not showing you any graphics, I'm just going to show you some things that I've made. Uh, and I like, as he kindly said, making uh, odd objects and things that do things. The first set of three slides are things that you happen in, ha may or may not happen across uh, in the environment. So it's really something that if you see it, you see it. If you don't, you don't. That's fine. So this is um, cruet uh, grit bins that were on uh, Brixton Hill uh, recently. Um, at Reading, uh, it's a visual pun, but we made this uh, with a, a, a friend of mine, a uh, floating traffic island uh, on, on the Thames. Um, here, this is um, near my adopted hometown uh, in, in Portland, in Dorset. Uh, there's this piece of uh, rock which is only ever exposed at low tide. And you get lots of ammonites in Dorset. So I thought it'd be really fun one sort of winter when there's nobody about uh, to carve out uh, this big ammonite print of a giant's footprint. And in the background there is a, a pool where kids learn to swim. And it's, it's kind of nice now. These are not ever announced. Or there's no, no, in fact, this is the first time I've ever public to told anybody about them. Um, uh, it's really nice to see kids sort of come along and sort of play around and they capture crabs in the toes and then at the end of the day if they happen to be looking over the cliff they go, oh my god, I've been playing in the giant's footprint all day. Um, these are more, these ones that I've been, these are objects that I've uh, been paid to make. So these are a series of forks uh, to promote uh, seasons um, uh, in, a, in a, a restaurant. So you've got a fern fork, etc. Um, and also it happens that uh, I, I, for a while I was working with a company, a packaging company, and I have a series of patents for ridiculously, for my mind, ridiculously simple things. So for instance, this waveform here actually increases the strength of a corner. You only have one fold, but you actually make volume and you make strength. Uh, and so I uh, have this deal with the, the, the company that I come up with the ideas and they, they buy the patent off me and then they gave me a little bit of royalty for it. Um, brick shapes and molds, you know, why not actually make, um, you know, real uh, sand castles? Uh, then uh, this was a, a twin-handled fork for um, a husband and wife uh, landscape uh, 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 gardeners. Um, this, um, you're not totally alone, Tim. Uh, this is a nose-operated peep show. Uh, I made this for an exhibition of embarrassing things and embarrassment. So when you pop your, your nose uh, in, you look through those little holes, and what you see actually is a really quite dull picture of a Victorian naked lady. But what you don't realize are two blusher pads uh, come out from the decorative mirrors and blush your cheeks. And the lovely thing is that when I was there a little bit later after the private view, and there was a couple of businessmen came through, and they were quite clearly killing time. Uh, and, and so uh, one of them had a go at it, and he said, boy, oh, no, no, it's not that great. And his mate said, no, go on, have another go. And then, you know, no, 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 it, it may change. And so he did. And of course, he ended up with these huge rouge cheeks. And he sort of said, listen, mate, we've got to go. We've got to go. So it was very, very nice. Uh, it, this is actually an audiovisual pun. Uh, this is a, a chest uh, that's had crockery in it in a drum. And then I took it actually down to Portland, uh, dropped it off cliffs, uh, dragged it around behind the car, uh, and then mechanized the chest. Now, if you've had a bad day, you press the button on the front and you get this lovely crashing sound. And it is actually very, very soothing. Um, this is uh, called Image Eater. And it has this sort of has a dual purpose to it. it there are sort of serious sides to this as well. Um, basically, it is a, a, a webcam uh, that's motorized with a printer mounted on the back, so it takes a picture. It then prints what it's just seen, and the instant that it's printed it, 
it uh, then shreds it. And it was, you can kind of see there's a bit of analogy, an analogy to you know, how news programs run or how our, our uh, uh, media runs. And it's got a very slight uh, arc on the, uh, on the axles. So it will go in a very, very large circle. So eventually it actually starts re uh, photographing what it's already pooed. Um, within teaching, uh, te and that's what we're really uh, you know, here about. Um, this, uh, this is a group of our first years this year. And uh, color theory, when I was taught color theory, bless you, uh, was not that great. So uh, what we've done here is that we've given some theory and then we actually, okay, so to everyone, right, dress, let, we want everyone to dress in, we give you the colors. And, and they chose our colors. I've got my uh, colleague here with me who uh, was given yellow, his least favorite color in the world. I was given purple, I'm not particularly happy with that one either. But we went out and then formed up, as you can see, and what we did were things like, okay, form up in natural order of tone or rainbow or complementary colors, and folk got to you know, understand, and it makes it kind of fun. Um, this is uh, uh, part of a project that we did on uh, navigation, uh, and we did that by introducing uh, uh, the students to mazes and making mazes and, and having fun with it. And then through that, one started to say, well, okay, if you've got, uh, if you are kind of lost here, imagine, for instance, if you're halfway through a website and you don't know where to go, uh, you won't know where to go unless there's some form of clear navigation within that. Um, we also, hack space, um, we've, it's, it's kind of very, very nice to hear the things we heard this morning. Uh, it is so fantastically confirmatory. Uh, here we've been uh, uh, taking to pieces old toys, doing, and actually in this particular case, trying to make them make sounds. Um, this is one of three studios that we've set up. We have a clean, what we call the clean studio. The clean studio is less dirty than the other ones. Uh, this is the dirty studio where you, you can get your hands dirty and you can cheerfully break things and nobody really minds. And then we have the middle studio which has now become known as the mothership. And the mothership actually has the majority of the computers in. And they, they, they sort of, the mothership actually gives birth every now and then to computers where they're needed. Uh, yesterday uh, we did... Um, a series of challenges, and this, is, this moves on to one of the, the key themes that Ben would like to talk about, or us to talk about, uh, is the iterative design process. Um, this is uh, the marshmallow challenge, and the challenge uh, initially is a very strict one, that you have to build as tall a structure as you can with spaghetti, and you've got very limited, you've got a yard of uh, sellotape, you've got a, uh, a yard of string, and a limited amount of spaghetti and one marshmallow. And you're meant to build it as tall as you can within 18 minutes. Now everyone obsesses about this and typically what happens is you get folks sort of start planning and saying, yes, we need triangulation, we need this, we need that. Unless they actually have, happen to have children with them who start spearing the spaghetti and that's a good thing. Uh, and then they build this thing, but uh, they then see that the opposition are starting to build taller things. So although they've got a really stable platform, they go, no, no, they're going to win. So they then suddenly launch up even taller and try, try and do a shard. Now, the underlying story of this is that when they get to the end, the ta-da moment actually turns into an uh -oh moment because they put the marshmallow on the top and the structure goes... Bleh. Um, we got several minus figures yesterday um, because the structures were sort of just hanging off the edge of the tables. Um, now, the, the, the real story here is that testing and prototyping, or as uh, parents uh, observe their children, playing, uh, is what's needed. If you actually start to play, you realize that this marshmallow isn't so light and that spaghetti, you know, in some ways, after you get over about this high, actually starts to wobble around the place. And we use this as an introduction to uh, the iterative design process, which is to say uh, that there is actually a process to creating. Uh, one of the things that we maybe, I'm not quite sure where we will get to this, but, uh, and I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but one of the things that um, uh, we witness quite a lot is, I know my idea. And this is when a student knows, yeah, it's going to be like this. And they then try and get to that instantly. And they come a cropper big time. 
And so what we try and do is to say, well, okay, you need to test it. You need to play. You need to actually know your materials. All the things that we've been talking about today, you need to be able to quickly prototype. It's in, in cardboard, in string, it doesn't matter. You draw them, whatever it takes, it doesn't really matter as long as you actually prototype. And it's a huge lesson and we emphasize it. Um, so I think probably Ben, I should stop there because that feels like my five minutes and a bit. I'm, I've just become the artist in residency, uh, artist in residence rather than the Raspberry Pi. I've literally only just started, so actually my presentation is more about what I've done before and how I've got to this point. Um, so I don't know whether should I just start. Um, I, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I'm really interested in businesses and people actually, and I've always been a maker, and I quite like the idea of moulding them together. And um, by doing that, I've always, I suppose, made objects or built situations where people work together and found a way to monetize them afterwards. Um, and I suppose I can talk about, actually, I had a really interesting conversation with my friend the other day, whilst in a kayak, actually. Um, and we were saying, I wonder whether we're going to be the first generation where money isn't as important as in to buy the house, to have the job, whatever, is not going to be quite the be-all and end-all. Um, maybe we'll be more interested in doing interesting things for 40 years of our life, okay. um, rather than perhaps doing the everyday uh, route. So I think I really live by that. And I will say, it's mentioned I'm 24, and I'm in a zone at the moment this year where I'm trying to think of what I would be thinking when I was 40, what I would like to do when I was 20, in my 20s, and trying to do as many of them as possible. Um, so I'm well, in that mentality. So like I said, I've only just started with the artist in residence, residency at the Raspberry Pi. Oh, sick. No, it says no. OK, I'll just, I'll just make this bigger, shall I? OK. So when I was at university, I was really into photography um, and actually started buying and collecting cameras, going to house clearance auctions all around the country. Um, and it was just at the time when digital was coming in and all the good old boys that built up a fantastic collection of camera equipment was getting rid of it all. So I was the um, plucky young girl in the van that would go and buy all the £10 boxes of camera equipment, um, pick out the bits that I liked, and investigate kind of, well, the quirkier the camera, the better, really. Um, and I got to know them and had published them all online um, and on Flickr. And it turns out what guys on the internet really like is a girl with a big collection. Um, and I got a reasonably big audience um, on Flickr, especially. Um, and I was really interested in turning that audience into something productive for photography, particularly celluloid photography. Um, so when I was at uni, I was developing film at home. Um, and I was simultaneously making tutorials on how you can do it. I'm, I'm not very good at being told I can't do things. Um, so I decided to get rid of perhaps the patronizing um, things that you can find in some online forums. And I think that goes along with electronics as well as um, film processing. One of the particular ones is developing color film, which if you look from posts about six years ago, everyone says it's impossible, the, the temperature has to be too precise. Um, so I made um, a tutorial where I processed film and also simultaneously made a pie. Um, and it, again, went down quite well. Um, I'm interested in doing things like the Straight 8 Festival, which I don't know if you've come across, um, but what happens is, is you have a Super 8 camera, you have one cartridge of film, and you have to shoot the entire film start to finish in camera, so no editing afterwards. And then you also have to send off your soundtrack um, without ever seeing your film. Then they process it for you, and if they like your film, you get it shown at the festival and you get to see what you did. Um, so that kind of lack of control, really, um, I'm really interested in. And this was the one where I gaffer taped my camera to the ceiling, ended up making a 2D film. Um, I'm really interested in overcomplicating my process, uh, especially in filmmaking. So I made quite a few films where I would shoot one image again and again and cover up the next frame and then carefully rewind the camera back and shoot on the other frame. Uh, which means you, you've ever come across that spinning disc where you have a bird in a cage and they're kind of spinning, you get both of them. Um, that's the kind of vibe you get with these films. And I don't know if this is the clip that's made my presentation crash, but you see vaguely... So I won't have that all going all the way through. So I was really interested because this went to the Whitechapel Gallery and it went to London Short Film Festival and it actually got shown at uh, Glastonbury Music Festival. And I got really interested in how different audiences were taking different things from this. 
Um, and it was about the idea that we're all kind of makers and we don't actually communicate with, with each other as much, much as we probably should. Um, and I ended up getting really interested in bringing groups of people together and mashing up disciplines. Um, I suppose I have run a couple of workshops um, and one of them would be the Tate Modern, uh, which was a drawing on film workshop. Um, and if you look on the top picture just there, I built this massive uh, rig that came out the back of my projector. Uh, so you could have strings of film going back and forth. So the people on the table would be drawing and mashing and whatever they wanted all over the film. Then they'd physically bring it over to us, we'd add it to the strip, and then they could follow their strip of film going all the way down the room and then into the projector and becoming magic and moving and then coming out again. Um, and what we found was people were far less scared to get involved with the projector and with celluloid film kind of generally um, because they saw that it was a physical thing. Um, and it comes back to that filmmaking being slightly detached now when actually when you start using celluloid, um, you start to engage with it physically, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, so after three years-ish of going around the country collecting camera equipment, um, I graduated and had a shed at my parents' house full of equipment that I'd been given by nice people going out of business and wanting it not to go to the tip. So I moved back to Norfolk and found that there wasn't an awful lot going on um, and decided that I would set up a community art space. Um, I'd come out of well, art school with that kind of dip in my creativity, um, with the online eyes of you just get completely stifled, you have no idea where to go. Um, I wasn't producing any personal work, um, so I thought actually what I'd love to do is use all this equipment that I'd found and build a space for people to come and use it. Um, so Seat Lab had a full dark room. Um, it also had a Super 8 processing machine, and it just so happened to be the same year that Soho, I don't know if any of you know the upheaval that they caused, but they stopped processing Super 8 on a regular basis. Um, so we ended up being, for a period of time, the only place in the UK that could turn around Super 8, uh, which was fantastic. Um, so we had exhibitions in the gallery space. Um, so downstairs we had the gallery space and then the dark room. Upstairs we had some hot desking um, and a full 16 mil editing suite. Um, so we organized events, residencies, um, hang on. Um, and that then I stopped doing that in March of this year. Um, so I had a good run of about 18 months. Um, the theory behind that all was that well, I didn't want to go and be an unpaid intern somewhere. And I thought, hang on, I have this space, I have this time, I'm young enough where I don't have people relying on me for money. Um, perhaps I should just go and do something um, interesting. Um, and the whole thing was about sharing information and making it less scary and just getting people involved. Um, so anyway, like I said, that's closed in March. Um, and I started building Zoe, so my creative juices came back and I started building again. Um, and I kind of got celluloid out of my system to a point, um, and then started being really interested in making things that could interact with physical environments and digital environments. Um, so I had this really ambitious project of building a garden, well, a robot that was in a romantic relationship with a garden, and the robot would be really neurotic and have human insecurities and she'd freak out if things weren't going well and if they were going well, she'd blog about it and show off. So this was the beginning of Zoe. So this was in my studio, um, trying to build the hydroponic system which ended up actually being quite simple and a testament to the online community of pretty much any interest group out there. I quickly found window gardens and if you haven't come across them before, you should check them out. They're incredibly charming. Um, but you can range from having a very expensive, beautiful-looking IKEA-style thing all the way down to using kind of two-litre um, plant uh, water containers um, to build gardens in your window areas. So I don't know how well that's showing up, but this is the beginnings of Zoe. I was interested in kind of, I suppose it's kind of steampunk light, I guess. Um, I was interested in using some of the materials I already had around, uh, which included an awful lot of old mahogany um, projector boxes and things like that, and reconditioning them and then bringing something smart and intelligent into them, but perhaps hiding within, kind of within it. I wasn't interested in any clear acrylic kind of thing. Um, so slowly built up Zoe. That's some of the insides of Zoe. Um, now from the outside, the only thing that you can see that's really digital is the small screen at the bottom. Uh, the rest of it, the idea was that it was kind of this Victorian toy that would move magically on its own. Um, Zoe is now up and running, um, and she's in my studio. At the moment, she's just gone through some repairs, but um, she's ticking over nicely. Um, and this is how I met the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, they were asking on their Facebook page who had made anything to do with the Raspberry Pi. They were showing something in the design museum. Um, and I submitted this and said, hey, I, I love you guys. I love your ethic. I love your community. 
um, they sent me a message saying they hadn't seen anything quite like this before, would I write them a blog post? And because I believe in asking for things I want, I kind of said, do you have an artist in residence yet? And they said no, and I said, well, I, I could do it, I'm, I'm just up the road. Um, and met them, brought Zoe, got on with them really well, um, and hopefully I'm going to be at the foundation now. Um, well, I am at the foundation now, but hopefully I'm planning on producing a whole series of Zoe Star Machines. I'm also interested in finding more artists to tell us about your work, because there's a fantastic following with the Raspberry Pi, but we're not hearing about enough art projects. Um, so please get in touch with me about those. Um, and also, I'm quite interested in developing a whole series of tutorials on artists that haven't used technology yet but could. And I'm sure that pretty much everyone in the room knows that Raspberry Pi is great for just a small media center. And what makes me really excited is the idea of rather than having a mini Mac in your plinth that you're hiding away and having 500 quid worth of equipment there, you could then buy 10 Raspberry Pis and actually do something really interesting and engaging. And I think it would only take a couple of tutorials to really lay that out there before people get really excited. Um, I'm quite interested in artists who haven't come from a technology kind of perspective to come in. I mean, myself, I'm kind of techie, but I hadn't, hadn't done the digital side of things, and I'm finding it incredibly exciting. Um, so that's, that's me, really. Um, Thank you very much. I'm just going to pull this out because I've got some notes on here which I'll use. Okay, so I've got a, um, a couple of questions um, to start to you guys. Um, so, if anyone wants to pick up their microphones and check their work in. Hello. Hello, hello. Okay. Okay. Hello. Oh, it's you. For you. Oh. Yes, it is me. No, it's me. Okay, so um, what I'd like to ask the panel is um, their experience of the, your, well, your experience of um, the importance of the maker community in shaping um, design education, design practice in the last few years. If anybody would like to say anything about that. So, you know, so what, what kind of value, so Kevin, you talked about um, kind of making as a kind of research methodology for design, so maybe you want to say something about that. Um, and, use some of the, the fundamental uh, lessons from that community? Um, well, um, typically um, research process, well, let's put it this way, the design process, because ours is a design program, typically you do a load of research up front um, to uh, investigate what your users you know, may or may not need and so forth, and then start making stuff. Um, we, we thought it would be useful to invert that process and just start with making something, put something out there, um, push it around a little bit, um, use it to collect data, and then iterate quickly in a sort of agile fashion. And that seems to work well. Um, so so we, we often start with making. I mean, it's as simple as that, I think. Um, and taking things apart, understanding things, um, and using making as a form of research, as collecting data, um, watching what you put out there. Um, you know, maybe it's not perfect, um, perfecting it as you go, um, and that's perfectly reasonable to a certain degree. Um, and then iterating many, many times. Um, so we start, start off typically with very quick projects, maybe a week or less, um, and then sort of stretch out to longer and longer projects on our course. Okay. I, I, I guess from uh, my point of view, one of the things that, that sort of change uh, in makers that's really redressing a, a, a big balance. When I was a child, uh, I had Meccano. And it was perfectly normal to have Meccano. And I had Lego, but it wasn't a Lego set that was instantly the space shuttle, or was meant to build the, the space shuttle. And I think that's one, uh, and our students in maybe 10 years ago uh, really didn't know how to put things together. They had no idea at all because they just haven't done it. They haven't played like that. And they've been given instead, uh, we were given cardboard boxes and you went away and you played with cardboard boxes and wooden bricks. And then you made stuff a little bit when you're older with maybe 12 volts 
that was, you know, very safe, and your dad sort of said, yeah, go on, look, take some of these old sockets and play with them. That was fine. This sort of thing it doesn't happen to, or didn't happen as much. Now, makers now are actually being encouraged in all sorts of really entertaining and interesting and technological and involving ways to actually start make, making things, and that will make my job a whole lot simpler. Because one of the things that we have to do is actually have a little class on how to stick things to, to things. And we have students initially who don't know the difference between a screw and a nail. Um, one of the other things I'd, I'd like to, uh, to talk about, again, this is uh, from a design perspective, is we've seen the emergence of design ideas as kind of platforms for making. So Sugru, um, the way that that is um, positioned is it's a platform for hacking and a platform for adaptation. Um, and the same uh, Bear Conductive, again, somebody else, and again, uh, both out of, this, uh, out of the Royal College of Art, is they're, that, that, um, they're, 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 they have physical products, but they're pitched as platforms um, for a particular activity. Um, so maybe, um, maybe, Rob, if you want to say something about that. I think, it, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. I think uh, it's more interesting to create a platform than it is to create just a widget or a thing. And when you create a platform, you give, you've, you've provided an environment for people to explore their own creative instincts and urges. Uh, you give them a, an arena and some tools within which they can play. And that's what we want to do is play. I mean, <laughs> we don't wake up out of bed thinking, uh, oh, I want to design something that's going to be a pain and it will be no fun and I, I took this career because I wanted to be in pain all the time, right? You want to play as a key piece of it uh, and experimentation. So platforms are interesting. In fact, I tell, like, when I'm tell, like, talking to my students, I, I say um, it's more interesting to create a platform because other people will come up with things that you never thought of that were possible. So, Shogru could be a physical platform. I mean, people make software platforms. There are lots of software platforms to support design activity as well. Um, so I think that's one of the key benefits of, a, of a, something like Shuguru or, or other kinds of phenomena like that. Thank you. Um, actually, I, I wanted to ask you, Tim, about this, this, um, this, this idea of play. I went to a, an interesting talk a few years ago, and I'm going to paraphrase it very badly, um, but it was a game designer, and, and it, he said, think of play as in the sense of when you describe your steering wheel as having play, okay? And this is, so this is the space where something happens, but it has no consequence. And I thought that was a really lovely way of describing that because that, that gave you a kind of free space. And it seems to me um, the maker culture and design culture really, really value that space. And, it, and it's, a, it's, a re it's a really valuable thing to create that space for yourself. And uh, I wanted to ask you if you, if you kind of recognize that and it's something that, that, that you enjoy. Um, I suppose the way I think of it, I'm kind of obstinate. So if people give me, you know, early, when I before I got, kind of got established, I would do all sorts of jobs, and I would think, what a stupid thing to be doing, you know, and I, I was very good at just sort of turning down jobs and saying, fuck off, it's just, I don't want to do this, you know, and, and so then I guess that's how I got my free time, to sort of mess about, find what I did want to do, yeah. I mean, being obstinate is quite useful sometimes. I think, I think as, a, as, as a design educator, I really struggle to justify finding that space in the curriculum, but it's so, it's, it seems to me super important to carve that space out, and it seems to me that that's something that you guys and I and I have, have been really adept at doing. Um, I'd just like to um, go to the end of the chairs here, because <laughs> I've just kind of stuck out well in there. But, uh, but in terms of, so you're you working with Raspberry Pi, so, you, so you're kind of an artist, uh, a maker, what do, you, what do you hope to, to, to kind of do in that role? Um, oh, I think I, I kind of touched upon it. I think I was really interested because it's this out-of-the-box idea, really. Um, so it gives you scope to kind of get into anything and move anywhere. Um, and I think, I, I was just going to say, in terms of it, the, uh, it being available at B&Q now, uh, these kind of hacking bits and pieces, I see it totally as a gateway drug. Um, it gives people a reason to get involved. <laughs> and, and I think that's... And if you give people a reason to initially save the pipe underneath their kitchen, and then they get hold of this material. I think that's what we want, really. We want them to have the Meccano, and we want a legitimate reason for buying the Meccano. And if that's to fix the pipe first time, that's, that's, gra that's great. And I think the Raspberry Pi is, is kind of similar. It's, it's kind of got this status now, which I, I keep meeting people that I haven't seen for five years, and they go, I, I bought one, and it's sitting on the side, and I'm not quite sure what to do with it yet. And I would really like to get over that initial barrier. And I think giving people a reason to um, is the first step. So I'm hoping to put some challenges forward. 
So I'm going to do things like, you have to build this this week and send it to me, kind of thing. Um, and just be a bit demanding. <laughs> um, that's the plan, anyway. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so um, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to hand over to the audience for questions. Anybody have any questions or statements? Um, yeah, am I, can you hear me? Yeah? Uh, nobody's mentioned secondary education. In view of the fact that the uh, government has recently tried to abolish design and technology from the curriculum, and also my personal experience, which is that colleges are pretty sniffy about students who do design and technology qualifications in schools, I was wondering what any of you would have to suggest, or have you engaged in the debate about what the new secondary curriculum should contain because no, you know, the government hasn't published yet what it, what it wants us to teach. It did publish a draft curriculum and then that's been abandoned in the face of opposition. I assume that you would all have quite strong opinions about what you'd like to see taught in schools and what kind of students you'd like to see in your, in your organisations. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, um, I've got a, 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 something I want to say about this and then I'll pass it over to the, the panel really quickly. Um, I was at a debate at the Institute of Education recently about the future of creative education uh, and I watched, um, I can't remember her name, so that, that's my fault. Um, she used to work for the R RSA and she now works with the a, 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 an academy chain and they were looking at re-evaluating particularly the D design and technology curriculum because it is felt that it falls well short of creative ambitions and sells students short at that level. Uh, the University of the Arts London is involved with um, feeding into the review of secondary curriculum at the moment um, and, and that's, uh, there are other partners involved in that but that, that's uh, how we have a direct impact uh, in that area and we also have an awarding body uh, at foundation level um, in the University of the Arts, which aims to be that bridge between uh, the, the scholastic experience and, and the kind of design-led education that, that, we've, that we've had. And, that, and again, that is, is very much focused on developing areas around this making and technologies and things like that. So I think there's a lot happening. Um, and I'll pass over to the panel now because I've got some people to want to answer. Uh, okay, well, uh, Kevin and I both have worked at the Institute of Education, so we have very close... Uh, understanding about what the consequences are that the, that the decisions that government has made, what those consequences are for secondary education, particularly STEM. Um, I think most recently the ch decisions have been, policy decisions have been pretty wrong-headed because we don't want to decrease uh, influence uh, and importance of STEM in the curriculum. Uh, that's one of the reasons that Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, came over and said, you know, Britain is lagging behind because you haven't supported, say, things like basic computing in, in secondary education. So I think any of the, um, uh, certainly my colleagues in higher education um, are aware that this is uh, something that we want to support and uh, all of us uh, have uh, participated in initiatives to support uh, students in secondary education uh, both in serving on panels and, and supporting policymakers when we can, but also in uh, influencing our departments to create events and activities to reach out to secondary educators as well as students. Um, so I'm doing what I can at least. No, I would certainly second that. Uh, uh, sorry, to talk over you. I was, I was going to say something anecdotal in that when I was at college, the most useful um, kind of periods for me, for me were when we took things upon ourselves to do our own things. Um, I, I personally started a group called Stop Motion Wednesday um, on Wednesday afternoons. And we actually had everyone involved and everyone brought their own interests in. And I actually think community clubs have a lot more freedom, not, not to reject what's in the syllabus, but actually I find the inspiring stuff happens outside of that. And it's when you can bring in textiles or you can bring in the, the girl that's really interested in English can come and write the scripts for you in that case. And it's, it's, that's when it starts to get interesting. And actually that's when the sparks and the lights light, the, the eyes light up with the kids. Um, it's about making it a narrative for them. Um, I would argue that it, it's a bad situation we're in, but the way to kind of sideways support this is to enable more after-school clubs and even lunchtime clubs and make that something that should be encouraged and even actually get the kids to manage these clubs and start them and build a platform that way, just anecdotally. I, I, I also, I mean, I, I sympathise. Are you involved in secondary education? Yeah, I, I would sympathise enormously with you because I, I, the government at the moment actually truly, truly is taking creativity out of education and it's astonishing, utterly astonishing. Uh, 
in the arts, it's the second, in this country, it's the second biggest earner, yet they're taking it away. Uh, and it's, it's very simple, it's being turned into a sort of binary right-wrong thing. Everything is right or it's wrong. Uh, where is the expansion? Where's the mistake making? Where is the creativity in that? I mean, it, it genuinely is frightening to me uh, what, what's actually happening. I have huge amounts of sympathy for folk. On our course, for instance, we actually take uh, folk that come from theoretically very, very unusual uh, beginnings. We have folk, uh, a student just recently who came from audiology to do interaction design. Now, this we're finding more atypical because of this bizarre way that we're treating uh, our, our school children. Um, I would just add one thing, which is that um, there's an increasingly artificial distinction between the DNT curriculum and the ICT curriculum, and Raspberry Pi is a good example, you know, where a computer is so small and so cheap that it becomes a material and a disposable material. You know, we hand these things out to our students, and they use them and break them and throw them away, and we get more of them. So. So it's a, it's a thing that you can use, you know, to make stuff. So if the D&T curriculum goes away, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I've been looking at secondary schools. It's another nightmare. Um, but um, asking about the ICT curriculum in secondary schools, what do you teach in ICT? Well, it's actually the same old things, and this is a, a whole other debate, you know, Microsoft Word, Excel, spreadsheets, uh, all of that stuff. So um, everyone knows that's got to change. Programming is coming in slowly, especially in the after-school clubs. We, and have, we have problems with, if we go into a school, we don't know which department to talk to, because it depends on what the head teacher decides Raspberry Pi belongs in. Yeah, um, exactly. So very strange. And, and, and one mentioned uh, health and safety, that uh, in chemistry you can't touch chemicals, and in physics you can't make things. <laughs> One of the reasons dark rooms disappeared from schools um, was because of the chemical issue. It hadn't been for the 10 years before that, but, but now it was. Very strange. So I have to say, though, that, that some of the artificial divisions, ICT and D&T, in secondary schools uh, are mirrored by distinctions in higher education as well, unfortunately. I mean, I think probably we're trying hard to break down some of these distinctions because we see the value of design thinking and creativity uh, across the spectrum and not limiting it to just one domain or another. But disciplines have been building their establishment domains for decades, and if not centuries. So yeah, it's hard to, I mean, truly interdisciplinary work is profoundly difficult to, to that, 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 that is so, so true. I mean, if, you're, if you go on a typography course and you decide that you want to do some illustration, it's not going to go down too well. And uh, we fortunately are called interaction and moving image. Now, if you think about that, you can do more or less anything. And what's beautiful with that is that students really learn and really find a, a pathway that works very, very well for them. Yes, we, we do bring them in, and there are, it's definitely design, and it is interaction, it is moving image, but it's a very broad church, and that has enabled, enables them, actually, because we, we don't say, no, you can't, you know, very often, anyway. <laughs> uh, we have another question here, Joel. Uh, this is addressed mainly to the educators on the panel, but I'd be interested to hear what anybody has to say on it. it Increasingly, at colleges and universities, we're constantly hearing this, either, are your students industry ready? And this is my greatest bugbear at the moment, because largely industry is the status quo, and they want people to come in and fit in what they already have, what they're already doing. Um, and we're really interested in getting students to play. The notion of play is, for me, one of the most creative forces that you can have, particularly when they're working across disciplines. And, uh, I would like to know from sort of the, the panel that's in education, what do you do to address this aspect? Because I'm constantly getting on above when they, we have industry nights, etc. We're getting these people come in and go, yeah, but can your students do this, this, and this? You know, as if they're all Mac monkeys that you're producing. Um, so what do you do to address that in any way, if, if, if at all? I mean, I'd, I'd like to uh, take a stab at that. Um, the, I think in the creative industries particularly, the idea that culture uh, is, is born from the creative in industries is, is nonsense. Uh, the creative industries, come from, creative industries come from culture, otherwise you'd end up as, it's like a snake eating its own tail, it would be, it would be dead within a year. Um, and every, you know, for every ad, ad agency's um, multi-awarded advert, I can find you the YouTube video for the, you know, the Japanese school kids' bedroom that they, that they nicked it off. Okay, and, and that's, um, that, that's, 
uh, that kind of speaks to the, this, this conditional uh, sharing creativity that the, the, the maker movement is emblematic of, I think. Um, so I think the aspirations for universities particularly need to be industry leading and not industry led. Um, that said, the, the ability for students to cope with the world that's coming uh, or the world that's here actually um, are, are, are very much uh, kind of life skills and, li and life in a, in a kind of network. So the ability to network with other people, the ability to um, use people at a distance to solve common problems. And again, these are things that are emblematic of the design community and emblematic of the maker community. So that those are the, the, the real skills. The, those, the kind of um, lone monastic expert is something that has passed and your ability to navigate complicated knowledge networks I is key. And I think that's why there is so much crossover between design uh, and making. Can I pick up on that? Because that's exactly something that was pertinent to your first uh, question that you put to the panel. Uh, what does the maker community, where are the connections between maker community and design community, design education community? Uh, it's not that we want to provide uh, people with particular deep uh, skill sets, you know, like a super duper expert on this one particular area. They need to be able to, to turn to a broad range of uh, 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 knowledge wherever it may be to, in order to solve a broad range of different kinds of problems and many of the solutions that students in design programs uh, will turn to the maker community because that's where the solution is. I mean, I don't, I start my, I, when I first meet students I say, I don't know the answer probably, by may, but probably your biggest resource is going to be people who are doing the same kinds of things whether in formal educational settings or not. So, and I certainly uh, turn to expertise outside of uh, education, the walls of education, to, to find solutions to design problems all the time. And, and people who can do that better, they will succeed. Those are the people who will be industry ready, whatever that you know, may well, mean. I was just going to take up in that, that phrase, actually industry ready, is that uh, uh, at, uh, certainly at the best, I think our students actually go out and they lead the industry. They actually are uh, changing the way folk uh, look at things. And we have, stu whether that is a student who uh, goes into maybe a more traditional graphic design studio and then takes interactive design with them and adds something to the party and then suddenly start thinking, thinking very differently about how the world is. Or if somebody says, you know, okay, uh, design us a bag, and they say, well, hang on, what's a bag? Why do you need it? Those sorts of questions need to be asked, and those, and that, I think, genuinely, uh, they, they, they can actually lead industry. Uh, we have another question here. Okay, um, my question is quite a short one. I've noticed a lot of different people in a lot of different areas, including science as well, saying the same thing about government making cuts. Would you say that maybe the people doing these cuts in government and in the political class of the country don't actually understand what's going on in general? And that's the reason why we're seeing them to a degree and they don't understand how best to optimize. And the result is we're ending up with cuts which are short term going to damage more than they'll gain through cutting actually in reality. That's my question. Possibly, but I mean, they've asked. So, you know, money has been spent. Our CUK, uh, the UK Research Councils have spent money to sample and find the information, you know, what education needs to be done. It just needs to be that the policymakers listen to the results, listen to the data that's been generated by spending money finding out the answer to such questions, which is yes, we definitely need to continue support for the creative industries because it's what Britain can do well. One of the many things. I, I would also say, uh, in my limited experience of contributing to policy discussion, is that there there is an innate suspicion of anything applied, um, so, so you know, so applied arts and things like that are always um, there's all, there's a kind of you don't necessarily know what's best for you attitude, <laughs> um, and you know, and it's it's not all pervasive, but it's it's definitely. Um, uh, the value of uh, the kind of culture we're talking about is relatively new, and so to feed into our political discourse will take many more years than, ha it ha the, than this stuff has been around for. So that's probably a communication problem. Can I just pick it up? I think this actually goes back to the point before, which was said in the earlier panel about working for free. On an individual basis, there is still this kind of attitude that we should be grateful that we're allowed to do it at all, let alone be paid for it. Um, and I think that seeps through all the way, all the way, and that's why they believe it's okay to cut that because actually we should be working in an insurance company during the day, and we should be doing this in the evening, and we should be really grateful for doing it. And that's a problem um, on a case-by-case -case basis almost. But I think that builds up. 
Um, I'd love them to come and chat to individuals and, and see how that would work. And perhaps even sit down and do their budgetary kind of system with them. How am I meant to survive on this while still being interesting? Um, yeah, I'd like to send so, it to yeah. you and send them to Tim's place, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I don't think you could teach your students a lot of the things that I do. Um, I actually feel that there's a lot of de-skilling going on because of health and safety. Um, no, I mean yeah, the government. Yeah. Send the government officials to your place. I see, yeah. <laughs> to, for re-education. Yes. Yeah. Quite right. <laughs> it's a re-education camp. Yeah, that would be good. No, you're absolutely right. There is de-skilling, for sure. There's been, there, there is de-skilling. There has been de-skilling. And also, to go back to education, I mean, uh, it was uh, 30 years ago that this country was absolutely known to be the best in the world, and it's not often you can say that about this country, the best in the world in art education. Is that still the case? It has been whittled away. We're still pretty good. And we've got some fantastic uh, centers of excellence. But it is, the money, has been, the, the money is still coming in, but where is it going? And what are the priorities? That, that seems to be the issue. Evidence, evidence of that is that uh, people from Asia are sending people over here to learn about how to do design education and arts education. I mean, there are huge numbers of applications from the other side of the world for people who want to know the knowledge that we have built up, right? Okay, we have two more questions, and then we're going to have to call time on this panel. Um, coming, coming back to the point about industry readiness, I wondered if you need to strike more of a balance between um, the experimental sort of play maker aspects and uh, more commercial and engineering manufacturing knowledge. So teaching students about manufacturing processes uh, and how you would design something, not, not just making a one-off tinkering in your shed, but making something that can actually be commercialized um, and manufactured in a larger scale. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's a very, very good point, and I think I've probably been very guilty of emphasizing that we do everything and it's all fun. Uh, we also do do narrow and deep as well. Uh, part, we've actually now unplugged, I could actually answer that with some other slides, but um, we do actually address to a certain extent uh, design as a process and a, and a step by step process and of course, uh, and we use actually uh, IDO as, a, as a, a pretty shining example of that where um, initially for instance uh, uh, if your heart stopped and you had the paddles brought out, it had to be brought out by a doctor and you had to have a huge trolley and it was a big, big machine. And then IDO turned that machine into a three-step operation that you can do on a tube uh, station. Uh, and not that our students all do that, but we do have the ability, and this year we've actually had narrow and deep. So where we've had some folk who've turned out to be generalists, we've also have some students who really, really are incredibly well informed uh, in a very particular and very industry focused uh, manner. So from my point of view, I want to make that kind of clear. It's not a sort of, yeah, you, you know, just do anything and have fun because that's not necessarily the case. But they do bring to the party because they've been with other people who've been generalists and they've seen a lot of other things. They can say, hang on, but you know, I may be doing this very particularly, this one skill, but there is some other stuff over here that might be quite useful. Can I just also follow up on that and say that at least I know most intimately at least three institutions that have very, uh, that engage very strongly with industry to get their students working and ready, like oh, for like year long placements, for example. I know my colleagues at Middlesex ha Product Design have year long placements for their students in places like IDEO or, or work with industries in developing uh, concepts uh, and developing design. Uh, directly that will be developing their abilities that, so that they'll be directly uh, useful to industry. At the RCA, for example, the la in the show this last year, we had some amazing and award-winning vehicle design examples that were showcased. Uh, at Goldsmiths, we work, on, uh, we work with the games industry to make sure that students will be ready for uh, the kinds of work they might do in gaming. So those are just three examples of where we, you know, we are definitely working towards providing uh, the kind of education that the industry expects, but also the kind of education that the students expect. I mean, 
that is an excellent example of what's, what's really critical right now. Students are not going to stand for spending 30,000 pounds and not having a job to show for it because they're not skilled for it. And um, obviously, I'm from the other side of the pond originally. In America, they've already figured this out. Uh, students are already looking for value for money. They want to make sure that their design education will lead to employability. So, Yeah, I'd echo that as well. Our year out, we, ha we have the option to do a year out as well. It's, it's incredibly popular. And just add one thing, which is um, often for us, it's self-employability. We like to say we turn out graduates who are unemployable, which is, which is to say that um, they don't go out to work in industry, but to change industry, as somebody said. Um, so I think it all comes down, yes, you can do the experimental stuff, but it comes down to those core skills, you know, drawing, actually making stuff with paper, um, core mechanical skills, all that sort of stuff is actually quite useful in whatever industry you go in. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to move on to the last question because we're running out of time. Okay, um, I'm an engineering academic and um, I know this panel specifically about design, engineer, uh, design education, but I, I just wanted to ask a, a um, link to engineering. When I was at school and I had to choose what to do next and I liked making stuff, engineering was the obvious thing to do. I, I don't think design was around quite in the same way in the late 80s when I had to choose. Um, and a lot of them, I know a lot of people in the making area have come from the sort of engineering background rather than the d design background. And um, I mean, from the academic point of view, you know, I, I did my PhD at Imperial, and it's you were kind of looked down on if you did actually make stuff. I, I, I was in the lab where we made medical robots, where you um, help surgeons operate on people. And we had two senior academics walk into our lab and say, oh, you're just a bunch of technicians, you make stuff. You're not proper engineers. Um, what, do you have any comments to where the making culture fits in with the engineering culture or engineering education? I, I know it's not quite the focus of the panel. Oh, well, you go, Tim, and then I'll... Okay. Uh, well, I, I was trained as an engineer. I loved it. And uh, I'm still a passionate engineer. I love, I'll go to building sites in London rather than go to an exhibition, you know. Um, I love cranes, you know, I just, uh, there's um, something about the scale of all the stuff that's going on with Crossrail, it's absolutely magnificent, and um, design I've always thought was a bit whiffly, and uh, it's something you can sort Thank of you. tack on the end, you know, but you've got, the important thing about my machines is they work, um, they've got to be reliable, they've got to be safe. Um, I know people, in t of course, design is part of the safety and part of all that stuff, but um, certainly I started off thinking the design was what you did to the outside, which is the easiest thing, really. Um, so, but to me, engineering is kind of fundamental, yeah. And I'm kind of proud to be an engineer still, even though um, I sometimes despair of the engineering institutions for making it look so dull. Okay. <laughs> I think your, your question alludes to one of my motivations for running this panel is that, that some of these things are converging. You know, they've been further away and they're, and they're coming together. Um, and I think in a world with the kind of complexity that we have today and the kind of complexity in materials and embedded computing that we will, in our environment, that we will deal with in the next 30 years, you need a material understanding of some of the underlying technologies to, to kind of use it as, as Kevin was saying. As, as a so, for a from a designer's perspective, you need a material understanding of uh, processes, technology, embedded data systems, the kind of material understanding that an engineer used to have about metal. You need that about the kind of complex complex things that we have. And so, part of running a make fair in design school for me is, is is to to embrace that because I think it is important that designers do that. And I think that design and engineering will probably grow closer as disciplines um, over the next 30 years than further away. Can I just again jump in? I, from an arts point of view, I was definitely looked down upon in my art degree for making, um, which you'd think was really bizarre, but actually, um, actually getting into technology was completely alien on my course, and making films was horrific. Like, um, and I think that's quite interesting. And when I was growing up and going through kind of high school in the 90s, and I hate to drop the gender bomb here, here but um, uh, engineering wasn't offered to me. Um, I was a maker, and you did that in arts and crafts. And that's how I went down that route. Um, I, I would love to see a world where they were all combined, actually. Um, that would be my ideal course, if someone could make that happen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, just... 
I'd also like to pick up what uh, Tim's just said there. I mean, I, to me, design is not the thing that's tacked on anymore. It used to be that graphic, graphics was turning into wallpaper, for instance, and now in, uh, that word interaction has changed, I think, the absolutely everything, changed the playing field, because now it is the whole thing. It, it's not exclusive in any way. I, ha, well, the fire extinguisher example, for instance, you know, that is, well, not a great piece of design. And engineering? I'm really pleased you say that because I'm program leader for a program called Design Engineering where we try and bring them together. So, Perfect. Uh, Good. <laughs> Thank you very much for your question. Okay, um, I'm going to draw this panel to a close. Thank you very much.